you are one of the seminal figures in the history of neural networks at the intersection of uh, cognitive psychology and computer science. What to you has, over the decades, emerged as the most beautiful aspect about neural networks, both artificial and biological? The fundamental thing I think about with neural networks is how they allow us to link biology with the mysteries of thought. And, um, you know, in the when I was first entering the field myself in the late 60s, early 70s, cog cognitive psychology had just become a field. There was a book published in 67 called Cognitive Psychology. Um, and the author said that, you know, the study of the nervous system was only of peripheral interest. It wasn't going to tell us anything about the mind. And I didn't agree with that. I, I always felt, oh, look, I'm, I'm a physical being. I, from dust to dust, you know, ashes to ashes, and somehow I emerged from that. Um, so, so that's really interesting. So there was a sense with cognitive psychology that in understanding the sort of neuronal structure of things, you're not going to be able to understand the mind. And then your sense is, if we study these neural networks, we might be able to get at least very close to understanding the fundamentals of the human mind. Yeah. I used to think, um, or I used to talk about the idea of awakening from the Cartesian dream. <laughs> so Descartes, um, you know, thought about these things, right? He, he was walking in the gardens of Versailles one day, and he stepped on a stone, and a statue moved. And he walked a little further, stepped on another stone, and another statue moved. And he, like, why did the statue move when I stepped on the stone? And he went and talked to the gardeners, and he found out that they had a hydraulic system that allowed the physical contact with the stone to cause water to flow in various directions, which caused water to flow under the statue and move the statue. And he used this as the beginnings of a theory about how animals act. And he had this notion that these little fibers that people had identified that weren't carrying the blood you know, were these little hydraulic tubes that mm. if you touch something, there would be pressure and it would send a signal of pressure to the other parts of the system and that would cause action. And so he had a mechanistic theory of animal behavior. And he thought that the human had this animal body, but that some divine something else had to have come down and been placed in him to give him the ability to think, right? So the physical world includes the body and action, but it doesn't include thought, according to Descartes, right? right? And so the study of physiology at that time was the study of sensory systems and motor systems and things that you could directly measure when you stimulated neurons and stuff like that. And... Um, the study of cognition was something that, you know, was tied in with abstract computer algorithms and things like that. But when, when I was an undergraduate, I learned about the physiological mechanisms. Uh, and so when I'm studying cognitive psychology as a first-year PhD student, I'm saying, wait a minute, the whole thing is biological, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you, know? you had that intuition right away. That was, seemed obvious to you. Yeah, yeah. It, isn't that magical, though, that from just, a little bit of biology can emerge the full beauty of the human experience? Is that, why is that so obvious to you? Well, I, it, obvious and not obvious at the same time. Um, and I, I think about Darwin in this context too, because Darwin knew very early on that none of the ideas that anybody had ever offered gave him a sense of understanding how evolution could have worked. But he wanted to figure out how it could have worked. That was his goal. Mm -hmm. And 
he spent a lot of time working on this idea and coming, you know, reading about things that gave him hints and thinking they were interesting but not knowing why and drawing more and more pictures of different birds that differ slightly from each other and so on, you know, and and, and then then he figured it out. But after he figured it out, he had nightmares about it. He would dream about the complexity of the eye and the arguments that people had given about how ridiculous it was to imagine that that could have ever emerged from some sort of, you know, unguided process, right? Yeah. That it hadn't been the product of design. And and uh, so he he didn't publish for a long time, in part because he was scared of his own ideas he didn't think they could probably possibly be true yeah um but then you know by the time the 20th century rolls around we all uh you know we understand that evolu or many people understand or believe that evolution uh produced you know the entire uh range of uh animals that there are uh, and, uh, you know, Descartes' idea starts to seem a little wonky after a while, right? Like, well, wait a minute. Um, there's the apes and the chimpanzees and the bonobos and, you know, like, they're pretty smart in some ways, you know, so what? Oh, you know, somebody comes up, oh, there's a certain part of the brain that's still different. They don't, you know, there's no hippocampus in the monkey brain is only in the human brain. And, uh, Huxley had to do a surgery in front of many, many people in the late 19th century to show to them there's actually a hippocampus in the chimpanzee's brain, you know? So, so their continuity of the species is another element uh, that, you know, contributes to um, this sort of, you know, idea that we are ourselves uh, a total product of nature um, and uh, that to me is the is the magic and the mystery how how nature could actually um, you know give rise to uh, organisms that have the uh, capabilities that we have so it's interesting because even the idea of evolution is hard for me to keep all together in my mind so because we think of a human time scale, mm. it's hard to imagine that like, like the, the, the development of the human eye would give me nightmares too, mm. because you have to think across many, many, many generations. And it's very tempting to think about kind of a growth of a complicated object. And it's like, how is it possible for that such, such a thing to be built? Because also me from a robotics engineering perspective, it's very hard to build these systems. How can, through an undirected process, can a complex thing be designed? It mm. seems not, it seems wrong. Yeah, so that's absolutely right. And I, you know, um, a slightly different career path that would have been equally interesting to me would have, would have been um, to actually study the process of embryological development flowing on into brain development and yeah. the, the, um, exquisite sort of laying down of pathways and so on that occurs in the brain. And uh, I know the slightest bit about that. It's not my field, but um, there are, you know, fascinating aspects to this process that eventually result in the, you know, the complexity of, of uh, various brains. At, at least, you know, one thing... Um, we're um, in in the field. I think people have felt for a long time. It, 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 in the study of vision, the continuity between humans and non-human animals has been has been second nature for a lot longer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was having I had this conversation um, with somebody who is a vision scientist, and you're saying, "Oh, we we don't have any problem with this." You know, the monkey's visual system and the human visual system extremely similar. Um, up to certain levels, of course, they they diverge after a while. But um, the first, the the visual pathway from the eye to the brain, and the first few um, layers of cortex um, or 
cortical areas, I guess one would say, uh, are are extremely similar. 